Forms and Social Cruelty by Richard M. Weaver Epigram And has not form two aspects? Is it not moral and immoral at once, moral in so far as it is the result of discipline? Immoral, yes, actually hostile to morality, in that of its very essence it is indifferent to good and evil, and deliberately concerned to make the moral world stoop beneath its proud and undivided scepter. Thomas Mann, Death in Venice Throughout the argument thus far, I have described culture as an achievement expressing itself in a form and gratifying by creations that develop in relation to this. What follows in this chapter will be a reservation or restriction upon this theme made necessary by the concept of culture as an affirmation of value. That cultures should be allowed to develop independently and exclusively not only is right, but is essential. There is a point, however, at which a culture encounters something comparable to natural law. This is not a law of nature any more than the natural law of jurisprudence is. It is a law that derives sanction from a universal consideration of justice. Accordingly, what will be said next points to certain bounds beyond which a culture cannot go without transgressing upon the principles which give it liberty. The reflections which follow have been prompted by a feeling shared, I believe, by a good many people that some cultures create and impose forms which are not worth the cost. These are among the hardest of all things to protest against, since their injustice is one of the hardest things to disentangle from their other effects. There exists no ready position from which one can tell the fellow members of his culture that they are guilty of perverseness in reverencing certain cultural forms. It is even more difficult to say this to members of another culture. Charges of presumption and parochialism can very easily silence one who has not well prepared his ground for the effort. Cultural relativism, as everyone knows, brands the very thought of judgments as silly and hopeless. But to the person who feels that he cannot accept all the creations and activities of a culture as equally good, and that he cannot accept some of them at all, the problem remains a reality which relativistic objections cannot dissipate. Thus, the cultural critic is met at the beginning with the need of a platform from which criticism will be meaningful. In order to achieve a critical vantage point of any kind, he has to be prepared to argue as solidly as he can that not all cultures and not all phases of a single culture have been equally happy for man. He can indeed show that this truth is recognized emotionally and practically, even by those who deny it theoretically. But once he has broken down this barrier to inquiry, the undertaking presents other difficulties. It is not just a matter of proving his point by weighing the modern New Yorker in a scale with the Polynesian or the New Guinea tribe with the inhabitants of a Swiss canton. Within a single definable culture itself, there may be good and bad features, as previously suggested, so that he has to get at the various sources of man's cultural expressions which issue in these. He cannot do anything with his findings, however, unless he has decided what it is that he values. Obviously, he needs as a sanction for his undertaking a cultural ideal, a concept of man's happiest expression and fullest enjoyment in cultivated living. He can rely only upon formal inquiry by the mind, for polls and questionnaires on such a subject would be supremely ridiculous. He will determine what kind of creature man is in respect to his faculties, and what faculties deserve exercise and expression, and to what extent. He cannot inquire simply into what will provide the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. The Roman circus, no doubt, provided pleasure for large numbers through the spectacle of a few wretches being torn to death by animals. Such enjoyment must be excluded on the ground that it is not right, even culturally, that man should be made to suffer involuntarily so that others can have a pleasure which is ethically revolting.
Our true problem then begins to emerge in terms like these. Culture, if we regard it as a harmonious expression of all the powers, has to be credited with a form which can be distorted. A philosophy of culture which is willing to face the fact of value treats as no less serious than factual descriptions the character of the human responses to this highly human creation. At this point, certain threshold factors should be taken into account. It is comparatively unusual for anyone to view his own cultural order with the detachment which makes ethical judgments possible. A person may sporadically condemn this practice or that institution, but it will be done in a spirit of pique or irritation. Resentments do not make one a philosopher of his culture. The great majority of men tend to accept their social and psychic milieu as they accept the physical earth, seeing it as something they have always walked upon and will continue to walk upon. Hundreds of assumptions and acquiescences, many of which date back to our training as a child, condition the attitude which we take toward the surrounding cultural order. Only a few individuals, and these perhaps only with considerable effort, can put themselves in a position to see things stripped of the affinities that develop in a hundred ways. This fact of acceptance is not as a general thing to be deplored. It is right that the burden of proof should be upon the dissenting, not the consenting, opinion. Conformance has its beneficial side, since the individual is sustained by his culture much as he is sustained by his set of habits, and it would, in most situations, only entail a loss to ask him to reform what has been built up through a long process of growth and learning. All of us are to a large extent thus adapted, and the result is a way of life which holds together related activities and makes possible the economy of expectation and fulfillment. On the whole, it is best that most men have a prejudice on behalf of their culture which is not easily overturned. It means settlement in their lives, confidence in their way of doing things, and consciousness of status. These things comprise the tradition of a culture, and although tradition is not the sufficient reason for a culture, it is a necessary condition. The prejudice in favor of one's culture, however, must itself submit to judgment. There are points at which it has to yield and these points are determined by the criteriological sciences of logic and ethics. I take the position that these have a universal validity, so that their conclusions can be used legitimately to criticize the forms of any culture. The assumption denies, of course, the notion that every culture makes its own rules in these areas. Its habitual ways of thinking, yes, and its mores, yes, but these are individual accentuations within the framework of universal criteria. We say that we respect cultures for their differences, but these differences imply an identity which must be located in some core of humanity. I have stressed the principle in other parts of this work that cultures are self-regarding or centripetal and that it is necessary for a culture to have this kind of independence and selfhood. But such grant of autonomy does not mean that judgments cannot be made among cultures or the various creations of a single culture. To say that a culture cannot be judged would be to say that it has no relation to the realm of value, which is quite the opposite of the truth. Modern social science, especially in the anthropological branch, has partly stultified itself and cast discredit upon its own undertaking by implying that cultural study should disabuse one of any idea of evaluation. For this, there was originally a plausible motive, since the less educated classes everywhere show a spirit of narrow condemnation which assumes that anything different from themselves is wrong and even deserving of attack. It was in the interests of scientific understanding and thereafter of social policy to make it more generally known that cultures have their own raison d'etre, and their own special excellencies. But the combating of this popular attitude was carried to an unacceptable point of supposing that the expressions of any culture are self-justifying.
that this issues in moral and aesthetic solipsism need no proving. On such principle, there would be no ground for objecting to the practice of the ancient Ammonites of sacrificing their children to Moloch, or of cannibalism, or of any other indulgence which we are not ashamed to brand as outrageous. It would leave us believing that there is nothing to choose between the culture of 6th century Gaul and 13th century France. It would force us to say that the culture of the Old Stone Age has as much to teach us as that of 19th century Europe. It may be true that the objective kind of approach, the wertfrei type of analysis, is useful in discovering and analyzing some lines of cause and effect which are parts of cultural structures. The suspension of the moral judgment is a posture regularly assumed by science in some phases of its investigation. But this is a matter of phase or stage. It is mistakenly assumed by some scientists and by nearly all who are simply infatuated with the idea of science that study can end as well as begin here. Some, of course, admit the necessity of the critical and evaluative phases, but think that these are better left to the more general student, whom we call the philosopher. However the case, such study will have to be made, for it is not the nature of man in history to sit with hands folded while different pictures of his potentiality and his destiny are being presented. The impulse to say, this is bad, this is good, and this is best, is finally an irresistible and rightful one. I begin, therefore, by rejecting the principle of pure relativism for cultures while accepting that of autonomy. I have elsewhere defined culture as something that satisfies the psychic needs of man. Now, either these are general and definable, which is to say they have a nature, or they are not. If they are not, there is nothing which can hold up a prescription for cultures. All is fantasy, whim, and innovation, and study would never uncover anything but an endless series of unique expressions for which there would be no basis of appraisal. It seems much more in line with truth to say there is a fundamental unity out of which these expressions grow. If certain things are allowed to happen in the substratum, the balance of expenditure and satisfaction is upset, and the cultural expression may produce more pain than pleasure. At this point, some kind of correction through criticism and an appeal to the theory of man becomes necessary. A member of a culture must exercise the right of detached criticism when he feels that some point of this man-made world in which he lives is productive of cruelty and suffering out of any proportion to the psychic rewards which it furnishes. Some practices impress us as not right, even when they are obvious outgrowths, at certain levels, of the assumptions and precepts of the culture to which we acknowledge allegiance. In the case of other cultures, they are apt to be more quickly discerned. The task, in either case, is to see how these perversions originate. Before beginning, however, it is well to heed some important cautions. Pain and suffering are highly individual matters, in the sense that it is often dangerous to infer from our own experience how another person or another group is responding to a certain situation. It has been proved that people differ greatly in their tendency to notice pain. One person will be virtually indifferent to what would leave another disabled with suffering. People as groups seem to differ likewise. What is felt as unbearable by one group goes practically unnoticed by another. Different mentalities and psychic dispositions enter into this to complicate the matter still further. Soldiers in the heat of battle have received mortal wounds and have gone unaware of them until the excitement of conflict was past. Ascetics have performed feats of self-denial which would be unthinkable to modern man. What may be called, for want of a better phrase, the mental set of the person makes his sensitivity selective and can virtually deaden some areas of normal human response. The human spirit is more a protean than we commonly suppose. It can assume shapes and accommodate things 
which we little suspect in our unimaginative hours. But all this is reservation. To say that the capacity to feel pain is differently distributed and varies with conditions is not to say that pain never occurs, or that one can make no inference about what will cause pain in the generality of human beings, and likewise with groups we are defining as cultures. Not all of the things in the past that we deplore from our present standpoint were felt by the people of that time to be onerous. One, therefore, has to be both cautious and imaginative in deciding what creations of culture are costing more than the culture can offer remuneration for. But having made this as an utmost concession to the relativist position, we can still affirm that some things are on balance demonstrably bad. This is true also of the forms of high cultures, which is the real subject of this critique. A culture opens itself to condemnation when it begins to attribute an imminence to the forms and institutions it has created. The source of the evil we are endeavoring to isolate thus lies in a false immanentization. When its products and expressive forms are no longer judged by their referential relations, but take on a kind of inner authority and an inevitability they begin to encroach upon other sensibilities which have their own legitimate roles to play in the life of the spirit. This comes about most commonly when attitudes which properly accompany aesthetic contemplation displace or swallow up attitudes towards something which has a function in the non-aesthetic world. In consequence, the object is given an illicit status from which many harms may flow. This can be clarified by a series of examples. A striking instance which comes first to mind is the high culture of ancient Byzantium. This form-loving order maintained a complex cultural life in that area between the Mediterranean and the Black Seas for nearly a thousand years. The relics of it which remain allow us to see that its life was heavily institutionalized, its religion largely made up of formalistic ritual and its art expressive of abstract ideals. It was wealthy, and for some it was pleasant, but it was cruel. The oppression of class by class seems to have been bitter and contentious, and its legal punishments were among the most barbarous and inhumane known to history. I think that René Gurdin, in his Byzantium, Its Triumphs and Tragedy, has revealed exactly the reason for this. He writes in regard to its capital punishments, Such terrible executions spring from the logic of the system. The greater the divinity of the institutions, one might say, the less human the punishments. This brief description might be paraphrased to cover the entire subject of this chapter. Wherever a culture tends to institutionalize and divinize its creations, it begins to levy an excessive tribute upon the human beings for whom these things exist. It falls into the temptation of thinking that there is some principle of imminence in them which justifies extortion, in many different forms, of the people. Let us move forward to the high point of the medieval period and the glory of Christendom. This era, mistakenly denominated the Dark Ages by some people, is one of peculiar fascination, it created one of the most extraordinary social structures of all times, along with a magnificent architecture and other arts which have won the admiration of posterity. When one looks at the religious side of the picture, however, a great darkness appears. It seems to us of the present period almost incredible that many thousands of persons were put to painful deaths because they would not subscribe to certain articles of belief. The amount of suffering which resulted from religious persecution in the Middle Ages was immense. John Fox's Book of Martyrs tells that there were in Spain 17 tribunals of the Inquisition, which over a long period of time sent an average of 10 persons each to the stake every year. And this is but a sampling of the great toll taken by an undeniably great institution, the medieval church, 
The typical modern man is inclined to see these occurrences as the result of abysmal ignorance or terrible wickedness. He wonders why the Middle Ages could not look beyond their own confines and realize how atrocious these acts would appear to the future. These people reared great and elaborate institutions. They fell under the spell of them and lost sight of their real meaning. When, therefore, the institutions seemed threatened, it is not well enough known that a chief contemporary defense of the extermination of heretics was the preservation of order, they were given imminent authority and a tribute of sacrifice was offered to them. What had been created in response to the human spirit and had referential justification began to be autotelic and to make its own demands. The forms broke away from the informing impulse and set up an autarky. Footnote. It would be difficult to find a better illustration of this than the Breviloquium of St. Bonaventura, written circa 1250. This is an exposition of Christian doctrine, rationalized and formalized to the highest degree. Its very organization is arranged to exhibit the classical aesthetic properties of order, harmony, balance, and proportion. Facts are always given in unitary groups of three, four, and seven, significant numbers in Christian numerology. Reasons are presented in the same groupings. The whole of Christian theology has been reduced to a perfect form. The dominant effect that emerges is an aesthetic one, such as proceeds from a complex but impeccable order. End of footnote. The judgment of the world since has been, and I should think the judgment of the world before would be, that this society had some things badly out of adjustment. Great encroachment occurred to the dislocating and the eventual destruction of what had been a great creation. From our perspective in time, we feel that the Middle Ages were guilty of human sacrifice, and we do not see that the sacrifice was necessary even for the rightful aspirations of the time. Let us pass on to the 18th century, which was indubitably another peak of European culture, although a very different one in the values it espoused. In manners, social intercourse, literature, and political creations, this was an era of brilliant accomplishment. But with all its elegance of speech, manners, and political life, this society maintained a penal code which was barbarous. Hanging was the penalty for some things which today would scarcely draw three months in jail. For numerous political offenses, extreme cruelties were inflicted. Thus, on the one hand, we see a high level of intellectual accomplishment and a complex code of deportment and social intercourse. On the other hand, we see cruel and vindictive punishments for what appear to us rather minor offenses against society. This society averted its face from these victims. What did it feel that it was serving in exacting so heavy a sacrifice? It had come to believe in the imminence of its own elegant forms, and was raising them to the rank of an idol. The revolutionary outbreak at the end of the century was wild and disruptive, but we must believe that it was to some extent provoked by this idolization of forms. It went to extremes and finally became enamored of itself, thereby proving our proposition in another way. It is a duty of the student of culture to consider how such corrections can be made less expensively, as well as how situations that bring them about can be forestalled. Suppose we turn now to our own day and to the monstrosities of similar origin with which we have to contend. It is not stretching the term culture beyond what I would include here, to call modern Soviet Russia a culture. Russia appears to us as a nation which has committed many dreadful things in a deliberate and systematic way. Even after reports of these have been discounted because of their possible political inspiration, it still appears that the Soviets have practiced what I am terming human sacrifice on a very considerable scale. There occurred the violent liquidation of the old feudal and aristocratic orders during the Bolshevik Revolution and the ensuing civil wars. Some years later, there occurred mass extermination 
of the independent farmers, the Kulak class, amounting to hundreds of thousands, if reports are to be believed. Then there have been the blood purges and the liquidations of political dissenters following trials, which have especially offended the sensibilities of the West. All this has happened against the background of a steady stream of exiles to Siberia and the forced labor camps. Again, we must look for the cause of these things, not in motiveless cruelty, but in the kind of idolatry which sets a form or a creation above its human sources. There is abundant evidence that the Russians have become wedded to a system and a dream of perfection which causes these sacrifices to look like incidental costs along the way. The advocates of scientific socialism seized power in 1917. Drawing their ideas from metaphysical and other kinds of philosophical doctrines, they came to believe that there is a destiny for society, and that it was their duty to make that destiny a reality. It had the form of an ideal classless regime, served by the collective use of all the means of production, and emancipated from what they considered the many false ideas that religion and social tradition had sanctioned. It appears that the Russians are so fascinated by this political form, they have envisioned that they are willing to pay the price, as other societies have paid a high price for other things. It is an engrossment that appears incredible and unpardonable to us who stand outside it, but as there can be no doubt about its general effect, there must be cause. If the Russians regard communism as a form with imminent force, we may expect them, on analogy with other societies, to try to justify the expense. The idea has become their god, and they regard it as treason to begrudge the sacrifice. It is the old idolatry, taking a new language, and made more monstrous by the resources of the new technology. Then, too, there is the bureaucratic aspect. It is much to be suspected that the oppressive weight of bureaucracy in our time, and in some other times, should be blamed in part upon the formal status that bureaucracy takes unto itself. Everyone who has tried to reform bureaucratic organizations has testified to the difficulty of touching them, to say nothing of cutting them down. The bureaucracy begins to assume an inner justification. Its size, its vertical height, with the various strata of authority, and its many offices and channels, add up to a form toward which one is invited, if not impelled, to take an attitude of aesthetic reverence. With so many people working together, reinforcing each other's effort, and presenting a common front to the world, there arises the image of a great creation. How can anyone strike at a thing so ostensibly designed to serve the needs of the community? To threaten it seems like threatening the very principle that underlies community and culture. The bureaucracy, having acquired this status as another means of survival, endures, even when there is crying need for its alteration or abolishment. A new entity has come into being to protect it, its formal structure as a thing in itself. By the time the critic has gotten past this, he may be too confused or too exhausted to continue. But it is by another and very different creation that I wish to test this principle next. It is so unlike the others that at first it may seem startling, but this is where one has to be on double guard. Those cultural manifestations which are near and dear to us usually seem to have a peculiar rightness and indispensability which makes us unwilling to classify or even to associate them with practices of the past that we are accustomed to deplore. Obviously, this kind of creation is a test of our ability to be both critical and candid. The most appalling human sacrifice of Western society today is the toll taken by machine culture. As just suggested, our familiarity with these losses has caused us to accept them and to deaden our response to the horror of them. But suppose we make an attempt to see the facts with fresh eyes. In 1960, in this country alone, 
about 38,000 lives were taken by automobile accidents. But we cannot stop with this figure. There occurred along with these deaths tens of thousands of injuries, some of them permanently disabling. The same thing goes on in all of the modern Western countries. A recent Reuters dispatch from London states that since the turn of the century, 235,000 persons have been killed on British roads, and the total figure for traffic casualties of all sorts is computed at 7,500,000. To such figures, there must be added the numbers taken by airplane accidents. I do not have statistics for civilian losses, but a statement given out not long ago by the United States Army Air Force shows that in peacetime, the annual number of fatalities from air accidents is about 550 young men, these being, of course, among the physically finest of the race. For a moment, let us regard this as an empirical fact to be considered. It is a toll exceeding that of many wars and plagues, and it is annual. While indeed measures are constantly being taken in the hope of cutting it down, there is never any thought of removing the cause. Not long ago, Dr. John C. Bugher, Director of Medical Education and Public Health for the Rockefeller Foundation, observed that, although automobile accidents kill nearly 40,000 Americans a year, we apparently consider this to be within reason for the comfort and convenience of automobiles. Whether the director said this with a forced expression, I do not know, but one can hardly challenge its truthfulness. It does not conceal the essential horror of this bargain for comfort and convenience. A society should have very strong reasons for being unwilling to sacrifice 40,000 lives a year and take care of several hundred thousand wounded. It certainly does not regard each human life as infinitely precious, if it is willing to trade about 40,000 annually for something that is certainly not infinite. It would seem, from Dr. Booker's account, that comfort and convenience, to which we should add love of mobility, have made themselves a new Moloch, and the idle demands of its worshippers not only the annual toll of life, but also a restlessness and superficiality of spirit. Yet there is another factor in the situation. It must be conceded that some of the creations of modern technology are triumphs of form. Their lines are so eloquent and so much ingenuity has gone into them that they seem beautiful. Footnote. The author recalls hearing an automobile salesman say to a customer, You are going to fall in love with that car. End of footnote. They appear endowed with a life and a reason for being of their own. The sleek body of the new model car, the outline of an air transport against the sky, these can be pleasing to the aesthetic sense. Such beauty and utility as they have can easily encourage the feeling that these killers are indispensable. These are examples of tyrannical forms right in our midst, which we find easy to accept and make sacrifice for, even while we deplore the humanly expensive institutions of other cultures. The air is filled with suggestion that modern Western culture represents a great humanitarian gain over any culture which has preceded it. Yet it would be very easy for some future people to regard ours as one of the most brutal cultures that ever existed. The statistics would be at hand to prove it, as well as the stories and the photographs. Why is it that we are incapable of seeing ourselves as brutal in this indifference? The reason is exactly the same that we described in other cultures. Speed and power and the formal beauty of the machine are the regions where we have garnered up our heart, and where a people has garnered up its heart, it is singularly blind to anything wrong. If they are asked whether they are not paying an exorbitant price for the thing that is being sacrificed for, they retort, How would you like to get along without that? Referring to whatever it is being challenged. The astonishment produced by the question stems from a love of the forms and the feeling of imminent power which keeps them in an attitude of worship until some power comes along and 
that can overcome this force. We must now consider the source of this power. The only way in which culture can protect itself against these growths of perversion is by attaining to a fundamental philosophy of the human spirit, which means that it has to arrive at a true theory of the nature of man. I assume, without feeling it necessary to argue, that man is supposed to be a harmony, that he is happiest when he is in accord with himself. What does supposed to be mean in this case? It does not matter for the issue in question whether we think of him as created for a design to be fulfilled or as under a necessity to express himself in certain ways that are not adventitious in order to achieve that consciousness of physical and spiritual vitality which is happiness in the unsentimental sense. Nor does this need preclude healthful tension and that challenging equilibrium which are necessary to his life and history. Both can exist in the presence of essential harmony. I assume further that man universally considered has cognitive, aesthetic, ethical, and religious faculties or means of apprehension. The first is the inquiring faculty, which gives him knowledge. The second, which is essentially contemplative, enables him to enjoy beauty. The third enables him to determine the order of the goods and to judge between right and wrong. And the fourth, which is essentially intuitive, gives him glimpses of his transcendental nature and his destiny. Unsettlement and evil begin when one of these activities is allowed to invade the sphere of another and to carry on its operation in that foreign sphere. The kind of invasion we have now been considering at some length is conducted by the aesthetic faculty, which finds its satisfaction primarily in form. When a culture has created its forms and has instituted a code of observance, it must, in the absence of the intellectual vigilance mentioned above, fall into an attitude of aesthetic idolatry. The forms are neat and beautiful, and everyone within the culture likes to see them work, which involves seeing them respected. It is easy to imagine that because they are beautiful and because they seem constitutive, they have imminent value and authority. This attitude reaches a stage of oppression and cruelty when it supports a reification of forms. For any culture, forms are necessary, but the reification of them is a morbid state of formalization. In this condition, the forms become separated from goodwill. They no longer respond with the right immediacy to the exercise of this will, but obstruct it with their self-constitution. The result is that the individual ceases to ask, what are the forms for me, and asks instead, what can I do to subserve the forms? Footnote. The attitude of these false formalists toward the human can be seen in the way that city people often condemn and insult country people. Urban living is always more formalized than rural living, and generally the larger the city, the more formalized it is. The people of the city begin to believe that these forms are respectable in and for themselves and they lack understanding and sympathy for the human being who has never had to accommodate himself to them. They are not for him because they are not responses to his situation. Yet the city dweller is prone to think automatically that everyone should know them and reverence them. So far does this go that in Megalopolis, the average inhabitant may be simply milked dry or crushed under the weight of them, until his comparative lack of humanity becomes proverbial. End of footnote. Looking at the principle involved here, we see that a formal tradition remains good only as long as it makes the due amount of concession to other powers when they are operating in their proper spheres. A form which imposes itself out of rigidity weakens the structure of which it is a part. In social organization, this is one of the most widely attested truths. A class maintains itself through an athletic vigor, which enables it to do new things and meet new situations without being shattered like a brittle object. 
It even looks for new blood, as we say, restoring itself and keeping its identity while assimilating fresh substance. Those classes which have allowed themselves to become castes, and those traditions which have become over-formalized, have not proved able to go on functioning as classes and traditions. They have behaved as though their actualization itself were a final end. They have lost sight of the truth that the vitality of a form lies in its ability to go on forming, and this in response to ordered demands of the spirit. But if the lesson is read most plainly in social history, it can be read also in the aesthetic expressions of any culture. Once the forms here have undergone crystallization, the power to respond to new demands is gone. It can be said that what the spirit aspires to is not the consecration of achieved forms, but something more like Aristotle's form of forms. The formalization of forms ends with their actualization in a spatiotemporal medium. But the form of forms is that impulse which causes the forms to go on forming, to go on providing for the life of the spirit without consecrating any one level of forms. Therefore, the attitude of the wise toward the creations of their culture will be one of modesty and detachment. They are good, and they must be surpassed. Any settling down in a belief that the final form has been captured is blindness to the nature of the ultimate process, since it is the function of the forms to go on animating. One can never say, here is the end accomplishment. Empirically, of course, there will be stops for resting and breathing, and there will be gratification over what has been done, but these are not to be regarded as final attainments. What we are affirming, in sum, is that a realized form must not presume to become dictatorial and repress the life of the spirit by claiming other kinds of deference to itself. Hence, any grading of moral status and imperative force to form in its spatiotemporal embodiment is a sign of danger. It is the nature of the spirit ever to transcend its outward creations, this being the strenuous necessity of spirituality. So it is that when a culture falls to the worshipping of the forms it has created, it grows blind to the source of cultural expression itself and may engender perverse cruelty. The degeneration may take the form of static arts, of barbarous legal codes in defense of conventions, or the inhuman sacrifice exacted by a brilliant technology. At some point, its delight in these things has clouded over the right ethical and other determinations of life. It is much to the point here that certain religions have shown an acute awareness of this danger. They have expressed in their commandments against various things a rooted feeling that beauty may seduce us to step outside the way. Of all the religions, that of the Jews seems to have been most uneasy on the subject of aesthetic indulgences in general. The edict of this religion against graven images, observed even into the present day by all except a few liberal groups, appears in effect a prohibition against the kind of costly involvement which we have been discussing. The traditional Jewish religion is nothing if not moral. It is, in fact, suffused with an intense and almost fierce spirit of compliance with the law. The claims of beauty have never made such headway against the thou shalt nots of the Judaic code. A terrible earnestness about the unrepresentable God has conditioned the living and the thinking of the Jew to an almost total eclipse of other things that other religions have not merely accepted, but cultivated. It seems to most of those outside it that Judaism goes too far in this respect, unless life is to be thought of as something to be entirely occupied by undivided subservience to a moral ideal. With the Jews, the fear of the seduction of beauty has amounted almost to an obsession, driving them to unnecessary lengths toward ugliness. The feeling that beauty is evil in say, 
reflects some primitive and dark anxiety rather than a free consciousness of what life has to offer. After all this has been said, however, we are forced to admit that it may not be without some root in sound instinct. Like certain other features of this religion, it is a protection, even if an overprotection, against things many peoples have yielded to. Early Christianity had a very considerable infusion of this spirit. It is sometimes pointed out as significant that the Christian Gospels were not written in literary or classical Greek, but in Kyone, the common language of the people. It is believed that this language was more consonant with the spirit of Christianity than the highly developed and beautiful language of Greek literature and philosophy. Indeed, if we look back to primitive Christianity in general, we find a large element of protest against the forms of a brilliant culture. The Greeks could out-argue the Christians, and the Romans could subject them to their government, but there was, in Christianity, an ethical respect for the person which triumphed over these formalizations. Neither the beauty of Greek culture nor the grandeur of the Roman state system was the complete answer to what people wanted in their lives as a whole. So we may regard the asceticism and the turning away from beauteous form of early Christianity as a resistance to the kind of encroachment that is defined here. A similar case is to be observed in our Puritans, who aimed at a recovery of Judaism and primitive Christianity. Everyone knows that the change of religion which they undertook was openly and avowedly a rejection of forms, rituals, and works of art of the medieval Christian church. The church had brought beauty into the service of religion in such a large way that those who journey to Europe today looking for great monuments of art find a majority of them in the products of Catholic Christianity. Whether the church carried aesthetic indulgence to the point of obscuring and even perverting the true mission of religion cannot be determined here, but it is historically true that many felt it did, and to their feeling we owe the Reformation and the Puritan strain in Protestant Christianity. This reform moved in the direction of a severe plainness. The Puritans cultivated an Old Testament earnestness about their spiritual state, with a determination to ward off the beautiful and the gracious by means of ingress for Satan. Their sober dress, the dreadful names they gave their children, and the utter simplicity of their chapels amounted virtually to a cult of ugliness. When they were victorious in the English Civil War of 1642-49, through 49, they showed no hesitation about closing down the theaters as places where art and the devil consorted. These facts may be branded the excesses of a revolt, yet down to this day there persists in most Protestant churches a kind of aesthetic aridity which is the consequence of this movement. A wholesome morality is inculcated, but beauty is suspect, and the incorporation of forms of worship is still a matter of much concern and debate among the various sects of Protestants. Again, we may be witnessing the authority of a sound instinct. It was recognized that forms had taken on imminent power and the decision was to abolish the forms. But the defect of this and of all such movements is that it is only another swing of the pendulum, moving from one extreme to the other. Such movements are irrational reactions to abuses, and we should not have to depend upon them for a settlement of the vexed question of claims. Is there no other way by which, short of accepting the authority of a particular religion, we can draw that line over which regard for the forms of a culture must not step? Clearly, if the question can be resolved by the intellect, it will have to be undertaken on the level of ontology, where the order of reality is envisaged. Only by appeal to this arbiter can we arrive at a disposition of the different roles of the aesthetic and the ethical. Even so, the problem is obscure enough to have perplexed so great a philosopher as Plato. His attitude toward beauty and the arts has been criticized as contradictory or ambivalent, a charge from which he cannot be wholly absolved, 
We know that in the Republic, he gave an explicit decision in favor of the ethical over the aesthetic, banning the poets from his ideal state in a high-handed way which has excited indignation. His charge against them was in essence the charge we have been leveling against the worship of forms. He felt that the poets, by playing upon the passions with their depictions, created many perverse attachments. Such attachments, though pleasurable, were not in his eyes worth the social cost. Therefore, he simply prohibited them. But in finding a solution to the problem, we do not get much more help from Plato than we get from the dogmatic commands of religions. It was Plato's limitation that he did not produce, nor did he have available, a science of aesthetics such as has been elaborated in the past two centuries from Kant to Croce. His great pupil, Aristotle, however, did take one step toward such a science. In his poetics, he recognized that art has a function of its own, that it is to be judged by its effectiveness in providing certain kinds of pleasure and not by how well it subserves the state or the individual in their pursuit of the morally good life. In a way, Aristotle visualized a separate realm of beauty or enjoyment, and when he turned his attention to conduct, he made this the subject of an independent work, the Ethics. One might say that Plato had no safe domain in which to confine the aesthetic activity, but Aristotle found one, just as he found certain sciences. Aristotle's initiative provides perhaps the key to the solution. Somewhere between total prohibition, or as total as could be affected, of the allurements of form because of the preoccupation and sacrifice they entail, and complete abandonment of them out of a feeling of their imminent worth which allows us to ignore their ethical consequences, a ground will have to be discovered. But it is not simply a middle ground. It will be a place which has to be determined by deduction from prior principles. Let us note that if we adopt Plato's doctrine that art should represent only that which is good because all else created distempers in society, a large portion of what the world has received as art would have to be banned. It would not be possible on such ground to retain the Iliad or the Canterbury Tales, or any of the tragedies of Shakespeare. And this does not take into account the great store of myths on which humanity has drawn for thousands of years, many of which have immoral endings, but which are forms of beauty and of instruction in some matters. They were composed not to further any specific moral purpose, but to deepen our vision of what is, to help us to penetrate to the structure of reality and potentiality. It seems impossible to deny the claim of art to some kind of self-sufficiency when we realize that the artist often labors to exclude from our response to his work non-aesthetic demands because these would interfere with his symbolic constructions. He asks that we grant him certain actually non-existent or impossible situations so that he can produce the apparitions which are art. Just as he tries to keep his realm free from interfering non-aesthetic judgments, so we, in preserving the bounds of a different kind of activity, may insist that art not try to be regulative in the practical realm. If art is to be granted its proper autonomy, it must show its good faith by giving up its claim to authority where a different kind of activity is required of men. In return for its independence, it enters into a solemn treaty not to encroach upon the rights of neighboring states. Returning now to the larger theme, which may affirm that the only way a culture can be restrained from worshipping monuments of its own magnificence and thereby becoming repressive and destructive even in the midst of splendor, is to recognize and preserve these allocations of the spirit. For if man is a cognitive, aesthetic, ethical, and religious creature, he must maintain some rights of office among these various faculties.
We have seen how forms may exert a double fascination. Men begin to fall in love with a formalization which has the effect of providing a second and unnatural vindication. What may be a fit subject for aesthetic contemplation becomes, with slight, if any, awareness on the individual's part, coercive in the moral sphere. But the sense of beauty or formal gratification cannot be indulged to an extent which deprives the individual or the group of those psychic fulfillments which come through the ethical and religious consciousness. By the full reach of this reasoning, the modern world, through its machine culture, has fallen into an idolatry no less grave than that of past ages which we are accustomed to censure. Its images differ, but their influence is the same and their tribute is high. We have given grants of power to things that we delight to create and to contemplate, and they abuse us and interfere with our better interests. But the road away from idolatry remains the same as before. It lies in respect for the struggling destiny of man and for his orientation towards something higher than himself, which he has not created.